Ladies and gentlemen, is a completely outmoded way to introduce evenings. It's so fucking binary. Let's try it again. Human beings, put your hands together for Faith Soloway. Hey, JCC. Hello to my Jews. Hello to my queers. Hello to my Jewish queers and everybody in between. Uh, very, I'm very, very, very happy to be here. I'm also very, very comfortable at a piano. Um, being here all my life, working for Second City and all of that, I thought I'd start with a little ditty. It's very short. I have a lot of short little ditties. We Jews, we've got a painful history that we choose to convey in minor keys. And we sing a never to forget the pain and never to forget the shame. So our songs, they always sound the same. Song number one. Song number one. Little teeny little, little songs. What do I have? Yeah, yeah, so um, my, my sibling is, <laughs> You know, I was the original lesbian. <laughs> so this is a little nanny, nanny, nanny beginning of a song. I opened the door way before you. I suffered the light of the day. I suffered the blows made before you. So I can't let this moment get away without slapping you around a bit, giving you a little shit. I was a lesbian first. I was a lesbian first. That's it. That's it. I want to do this really nerdy thing of looking in the audience and seeing you. It's that classic thing where I really can't see you, but I can feel you. So it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. My sister, my sibling, I've been trying to figure out how to, how to get the pronouns right and everything, so I have this little tiny parody that's gonna help me out. Let's see, this is very short too. They're non-binary, hear them roar, in sports bras too tight to ignore. And they know too much to go back and date me. That's it, that's all I have for that one. little samplers, like a Jewish Whitman sampler of candy songs. So I definitely have been struggling with, I want to accept the gender that I am. I think I'm a little bit of everything. I haven't quite claimed my identity um, being in my 50s. And I, uh, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, if you like Joni Mitchell, you won't like, thank you, you won't like what I'm doing to her right now. <laughs> Little thing I realized. Gender is just sausage casing. We're twisted up links and still we're tracing our blue and pink DNA. But sausage is also brown and green. Oh, I wish I had a gender I could ski. Gender is just the grammar we're swimming and we're drowning in words like men and women and all the she's and he's and hers and him's. No long come these and thems. Oh, you wish I had a pronoun. I could skate away on sausage casing. Okay. That is, thank you. <laughs> You know it's bad when you have to end all of your songs with, okay, that's done. <laughs> there are works in progress, but you know what's not a work in progress? My sibling, the creator of Transparent, the writer of She Wants It, She Wants It, She Wants It, and now they want it. Ladies and gentlemen and non-binary folk, let's give it up to Jill Soloway. Sibling. Thank you. Oh, 
God. I love having you on the stage with me. There, I, there's nowhere I'd rather be. I might be interrupting uh, some of the uh, things going on today with my little song glitz. Interrupt away. It was like a, it was like a platter of appetizers. Your songs. It was all just a taste. Of just each. a taste. Just a yes. Um, hey there, Jews and San Franciscans. <laughs> We're so excited to see you guys. This is our, you guys are our people. This is, we've been touring. We've been going to Philly and New York and all kind. but this feels like, this feels like our, this is a very Soloway crowd here. Right. Hometown crowd. We, we, we uh, went to JCC camps when we were little. We did, yes. We went to the J. On a wagon bound for market. Remember that song? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of you guys remember all that the weird Holocaust song? songs. <laughs> weird song. <laughs> <laughs> set, set a calf with a mournful eye. <laughs> high above. I won't keep going. There are people here who grew up singing Dona, right? Happy donuts, milk and ginger ale, high, high pizza pie. David Mech- Melech Israel. Da- Remember that one? We, did you it's sing it's donuts, milk and ginger ale like yeah. we did? Is that just a Chicago thing? Do you want to talk about your book? I'll just sit, be right here. No, it's good. We're just getting our, JC, our, JC, our JCC vibes on. The J. We called it the J. Um, but we've been on this tour, and I think there's, it's a moment in time right now in the culture where we haven't been quite content to just do book tour. We've really, I've been so lucky that my friends have come with me, and we've tried to create these moments, these evenings, what we're going to do tonight, that are a little bit of everything, obviously the comedy, with taters and some music, but also like I really want to have the real conversations that we want to have about the state of the world right now. Um, These questions about gender and consent, they really could not be more pertinent to this very, very moment. People are like, is it hard to be on your book tour? And I'm like, actually, four weeks ago, the entire country was talking about the meaning of consent, and there's a lot of that in the book. I'm pointing to the book, but it's not here. In other cities, there was a book sitting right here. (laughs) The picture. Um, and then, yeah, what's been going on in terms of, you know, the administration trying to erase uh, trans people's identities. So, yes, it's, it's, ta- it's we, we need to figure this out together um, by being in rooms and talking about a narrative around our otherness, all different kinds of otherness, and see how we can start to um, take on this, this fascism that's happening. So yeah. we just want to acknowledge that that's the mood everybody's in right now, where they're upping their Lexapro, they're, <laughs> you guys are getting all your medical marijuana. We know everybody's titrated just to even get out of your house. <laughs> it's like to be here is a yeah. big deal. Just that you came here tonight, yeah. And we take, we mm-hmm. take it very seriously. We want to, we want to have an evening where we're, where we're, where we're holding space for how, how much everybody's feeling. And so what I've been doing in each city is just bringing some of my favorite thought leaders, my the greatest thinkers, feminists, and heroes, and I'm so lucky that we happen to be in the hometown of Fabiana Rodriguez. Let's welcome her out. Fabiana Rodriguez, Fabiana Rodriguez, Fabiana Rodriguez. Sit your ass down! <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Fabi, hi! hi. I'm How's so going? excited. I know Me we're going to talk about Transparent, but just such, such a celebratory moment. Your book. My book. Is out. She wants it. Yeah. So, so tell us about the title, why she wants it and not why they want they it. They want it. Right. So yes, the non-binary thing is this. It's interesting. I was just talking to some of the youth in the youth program and talking about this coming to this non-binary place where I'm, I'm defining myself as non-binary. And it's, it was less like a huge... Um, transition, you know, coming out of a door and more of a slow thing of getting rid of pieces of parts of me that I felt like didn't help anymore. And so I guess the first one was heterosexuality. That was annoying. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was like, I don't need to do that anymore. (laughs) Woo, thank God. (laughs) And then the next one was, uh, I think, like, feminist. Mm -hmm. So that was like, I'm getting rid of this fucking curling iron. I'm getting rid of this fucking makeup. And I... I don't want to be femme shaming or femme phobic. It just wasn't right for me. I knew that like it always felt like a burden to do this thing called getting dressed up and it wasn't really about getting dressed up because I love getting dressed up. Now it was about you know not being able to get away with my sort of gender free existence. Like at work I would be wearing a t-shirt and jeans and then it would be like, "Okay, it's time for us to take a picture of you because 
were doing some press for a transparent, and I'd be in the writer's room working, and then I would have to go into another room and get like my hair and makeup done for yeah. hours so that I could get my picture taken for fucking Writer's Guild magazine. Yeah. And I was going like, I know that Judd Apatow isn't doing this. Yeah. And why do yeah. I have to do it? And I really started to feel like the burden of femme presentation for me became like, prof like I, I thought that to look professional, I had to get a whole thing done. So I was starting to just go like, I'm not doing that anymore. So it was like, basically non-binary was me like running away from things that were annoying at first. Yeah, and then, so I'm gonna get yeah. to the title. It's coming. Um, so yeah, I just want, like, I know there are like, even people in my life who are here tonight, like we didn't even know you were non-binary, Jill, so don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. I'm kind of just like half joking, so. <laughs> no, it's, it is, it actually feels like a really homey place to be, and I've been thinking of myself as non-binary for years now, but as I was writing the book and I'm like coming out, on the book tour, I realized I really couldn't use female pronouns on this book tour and talk about women's issues because I didn't really feel like I wanted to be that kind of an expert. And little did I know, I would be on The View as the first non-binary person. Yes. It was crazy, guys. Yeah, that was a painful interview. Yeah, because they yeah. don't know what's up, right? Well, or, just that the, yeah. they were not even accepting the language. It's like they were processing, and I'm almost yeah. like, you know, come on, we're in a new reality. Yeah. And you know, and, well, in, in, in your book, one thing that was really um, interesting to be on this journey with you is I remember when we first met, yes. we took a hike um, in Griffith Park. You started asking me about polyamory and like what it means to be free and just, so I've never felt that you've been binary. You've always rejected mm. these kind of like concepts. Um, and in the book, you are going on this journey to really find your emancipated self mm -hmm. uh, and to feel uh, loved in the way you want to be loved. And I found that um, as you were also developing your art, it was like your ability to be free was also being expressed in your art. And so can you talk about what that journey was and what it was, how it was translating into your work as you were finding really the way to connect and, and express yourself in your fullness? Yeah. How was that, it, it felt like these two parallel paths yeah, I think it was like coming to terms with my creative process, which was one of allowing and of holding space as a form of desire. Um, I think a lot of male directors or kind of like typically masculine directors have their script and they go down to the set and then they kind of like stand at the monitor, kind of, you know, like this, they watch, they watch on the monitor. And then the actors do stuff and they kind of like watch the monitor like they're just like, yeah, yeah. And like, like they're getting things with yeah. each, like, yeah. You know, there's kind of like a, <laughs> nailed it. And then I think all the actors feel like their job is to nail it for the director, right. nail it for the writer, make it right for the people who are um, paying for it. And my process was really about just allowing, bringing some stuff from Chicago, improv theater, the yes and feeling of process over product meaning that we just always remember that the doing of it is more important than what becomes. So we're always honoring, let's have a good time, let's be kind to each other, let's not throw each other under the bus, let's take risks. The moment, the present is the thing. And I think that's, that's really what I've been finding about myself is that as an artist, I like to hold, like, be in the space where you can really feel, I think it's actually a, being in the place where boundaries are and creating space in those boundaries to feel safe, to take risks. I think that's like my directing style. Yeah, and I think, you know, topple the patriarchy. Let's talk yeah. about the patriarchy for a second. Yes, um, and you, that you, darn patriarchy. You, you, you refer to this in, in, in your activism that Hollywood is really controlled 96 to 98%, whether it's the board, the financing, the people behind the camera scripts, 96 to 98% white, cis, hetero men. Yeah. And you talk about the white, cis, male, hetero gays, and even just how their entire approach has really defined um, the entertainment industry. Uh, yeah. And when, and, and, and you talk about the, the female gays, right? Or the, the, the a gays, any kind of gays, uh, that is different to that. But, but talk about um, what, in, in, in terms of how you are viewing the world, w tell us about intersectionality and what do you mean when you say the female gaze? 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's this, this journey of trying to figure out how I want to do things and, and identifying as non-binary, I think, automatically takes me back to a childhood of, you know, taking in media that was uh, written and directed and created by men. And, um, like, for example, The Love Boat. You don't Love, have to play it. exciting and new. I just thought you were going to play it. But I, I think about, like, a classic <laughs> shot on The Love Boat, okay? So... This is what I grew up with. And I always say this when people are like, Jill, do you really feel like it's okay to be making feminist propaganda in your art? And I say, you know, um, all men ever did was make propaganda for masculinity, as evidenced by a shot that we would see on the love boat all the time growing up. It opens on two boobs. And you're like just looking at a woman's tits. And then you reveal that she's actually putting some glasses on a tray and she's the waitress. And then you follow the tits and the glass across the Lido deck. And then she sets down the glasses and then the scene starts. Okay, we grew up watching this. And this form, this way of using women as just things to you know, start a scene, just shiny things, um, is one of many, many, many things that are examples of, I think, how I felt like I always had to think about being looked at before I could think about being. And I think that's a real, it's a real psychic problem for girls and women. And in fact, the idea that we're creating a kind of convex self around men looking to make sure that we're either seen or not seen, but always in a very particular way. You know, standing on this like quarter inch of real estate where you need to be beautiful and sexy, but not too sexy. And this, there's this kind of handcuffs that we're in where we're not taken in as people, um, especially when we're young, we're taken in as, you know, how well we do at performing aesthetically. And I think that was like a real weight on me. So um, I'm always just trying to not be that guy who's looking and instead be the looked at and looking back or returning the gaze. I have a talk that I did at Toronto that's um, online called The Female Gaze that I was like, nobody's branded the word female gaze yet, so I'm gonna take it. And I, <laughs> so yeah, I talk about just trying to center otherness as an experience for the audience of just sitting in the seat of somebody other than the white male protagonist, protagonist. And as you start to do that, we just realize how much we are defined by the ways that we, you know, we're attempting to get power from men, uh, or we have been our whole lives, whether or not we even know it. You know. Well, also how much it shapes culture, because um, everything we see, interact with, eat, and visually engage with is shaping our imagination. Yeah. And to know that overwhelmingly the content is coming from one point of view is very troublesome, particularly in times of major inequality, yeah. whether it's gender or racial inequality. And one of the things that really stands out about um, just you know, getting to know you, not just as an artist, but as an activist, is that you also very much name intersectionality. And throughout, throughout the book, so many of your experiences, even growing up, were very much about intersectionality, yeah. like your childhood. So yeah. can you say a little bit about that and both um, how different experiences with different communities, whether it was uh, communities of color or connecting uh, with people with disabilities, how, um, has, how is that now shaping your work? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think I've been saying like that, that the experiences that people have under patriarchy and white supremacy um, are all the same, the same, the same essence, you know. That like a woman walking down the street, the street in a world where men, are, you know, are in charge, is never safe. As well as a black person walking down the street in a white world is never safe. And and sometimes I say, you know, that it, it's this is all that kind of like feeling of fascism, of otherizing, of Trump's America going. Okay, you get to you know call that person a name and call that person a name and feel that power. Um, and so I think I started looking at the world that way because Faith and I grew up in this neighborhood called South Commons in Chicago. And it was actually an experiment in racial integration and class integration where people lived in uh, different kinds of multi-use multi housing. There were stores there. It was this little kind of like cloistered community that was very, you know, about half and half black and white. My mom was a major activist and was really trying to like live the civil rights movement. We were really living it 
in that neighborhood. In fact, Faith and I went to an almost all black school and sang, we are young, gifted, and black. And that's a fact. It wasn't a fact, we weren't. But, uh, <laughs> we thought we were. And we didn't really know the idea of race. And if we did, we felt more like um, that black people were the majority and that, and that our whiteness actually felt like a minority. And, and we were trying to fit in in a way that I think made me really understand um, just feeling other and wanting that otherness to have a certain kind of subjectivity. And so, yeah, I think now we're noticing that what Trump has done is really named um, this kind of cultural masculine, you know, Kavanaugh rooting for patriarchal bullshit. And it's, it's starting to happen now where not only are women saying the ways that masculinity or toxic masculinity has made them feel unsafe, but men are starting to say it actually. And I really am appreciating that happening in our culture as men are starting to say, yeah, here's the way that toxic masculinity ruined my childhood. These are the rooms that I was in as a teenage boy that I didn't want to be in. These are the things that happened when I was in college that I you know, didn't stand up and I wish I had. You know? So I think as people all start to realize that we're all victims of this kind of you know, bullying culture and that nobody really wants it, um, to me it's like yeah, giving that protagonism to all different kinds of people to have that chance to say I am instead of I am that. You know, it's, it's like the feeling of being the, the seer is such a privilege. Being the person who names what they see and, and feels comfortable enough in their body to just be like, I see this, I see this, I see this. And this feeling of just like looking is something that's mostly only given to white people and to men where they just feel like I'm the default person, I walk into the room, this all is mine. And the, the pose for me, the change from, you know, the being, you know, trying to be cute or trying to be, you know, whatever it was I was trying to be when I thought I had to be <clears throat> cute if I was gonna be powerful to just trying to take up space without, right. without exactly. taking up taking too much up space. space. You don't wanna imitate patriarchy, you don't wanna like, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to really, right. I don't want to do that stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a personal thing, it's a psychological thing, and it's also political and spiritual. It's, it's, to me, it's all the same thing. It's how do we be in the world, how do we lead with vulnerability, and also find a way to kind of take up space um, without tr trampling on other people's boundaries. You know, we're live, we're, we have to live it. We're all having right. to live it every day to figure out how, how we want to be and who we want to be. Um, and still yet you know, see other people's difference and see other people's otherness. Right, I mean, as, as artists, in a way, we're, we're shaping the culture. We are often uh, discussing things and creating things that are many years faster than what's gonna happen in yes. the policy space. And you know, just, just, it was about a year ago that um, courageous survivors spoke out about, against Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. And you know, you talk about shared language, and you, you, I love what you said, which is you say you have to name it, because in us naming it, we begin to normalize, and we begin to say, to share your story. Mm -hmm. It was about a year ago where um, Alyssa Milano, after hearing uh, the, 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 the words that Tarana Burke had said, me too, began to share it out, and there was a, a Me Too moment. Mm. Um, and it was in this kind of context of cultural change. So much of what the book is about is about this pivot point mm. uh, and, and, and you looking at the past from this pivot point, which is that in your industry, this very powerful moment happened where a lot of women who had once been isolated and hardly ever saw each other or talked to each other mm -hmm. got together and said, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, this is our, ind why do these white men have so much power? Yeah. So can you talk about that moment? Because I think sometimes people say, well, you know, these Hollywood women or what, what, what you know, it's, it's these white, rich women speaking out. And what I find is that even if you are rich, and powerful and you have all this visibility that even then, that there's no es escaping this, that this is so normalized. So can you talk a little bit about what was happening in those moments, the, the, those rooms, um, on how people were coming together yeah. and getting conscious 
to a very systemic problem and how rapidly that yeah. became a, a movement. Yeah, I mean, things do happen so rapidly, which is, a, which is, I think, why I still remain incredibly excited that you and I can come to an answer tonight or a question that will spark something and that, and that we're still capable of finding these moments where we can actually change the world in an instant when you think about how quickly that happened with, mm -hmm. with just having yeah. those words. And I think about, you know, um, shame and fear and, um, yeah, that even with, like, the amount of power that I would have had at this point, um, you know, a year ago or two years ago, I still was constantly and am constantly in fear of doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing, saying too much. And I think a lot of women, yeah, were very, very isolated. So we were all dealing with really watching structures crumble around us, just watching the power of women speaking just kind of, things were like literally toppling. Yeah. You know, well, like I, I won, like, I think it was like an M, the, when I won an Emmy, I said, topple the patriarchy. But like, I literally didn't think it was going to happen. Right. <laughs> just saying it. <laughs> I'm not taking responsibility for it, guys, but I did not think it was going to happen. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just beginning. You know, I think we're realizing now what's going on is that, is that we all are starting to create a common narrative around being able to see what, you know, what is meant by the word patriarchy. And, and it, it is as simple as um, just wanting to be safe and to feel powerful if you're not a man and if you're not white. That's, I think, how it's as simple as that. So, yeah, we were in, I was in those rooms, those, that early times up, room with everybody and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, why'd they invite me? It's like, maybe because I'm queer and they don't have any queer people. <laughs> um, <laughs> how'd I get here? You know, all, and actually as we went around the table and all the women talked and it's like all of these really powerful people, everybody's like constantly filled with shame and fear of speaking because everybody's so used to, I think, there's a kind of like, unconscious protection of male privilege that we do as part of just our everyday life where centering men and uh, centering, you know, the men in our lives just to, just to kind of keep the peace in the home um, because I think a lot of men are so used to having their reality centered. Um, so we just keep doing it. And I think now it's happening politically where we're noticing, okay, the things we do in our lives are happening politically and kind of no more. We don't want to, you know, to, to have what happened with Christine Blasey Ford and for her to get up there and speak her truth and for so many women to say, oh, yeah, I've been there and I know that feeling. And to have, you know, this thing named, which she talked about, which there's a philosopher named Lily Loofborough who talks about this thing called toxic homosociality, which is, again, like naming things and for me to have the language that another feminist writes. And I go, oh yes, toxic homosociality. That's when one man woos another by humiliating women. Mm. We all know that it happens. Men especially know that the kind of elbow, elbow, she wants it. You know, that, in fact, that's getting back to the title of the book. <laughs> a long way to get there, but I answered the question. <laughs> we got there. We got there. <laughs> so She Wants It is the title of the book because it's really about that moment when uh, two men can use the phrase she wants it as an insult, as an invitation for assault, as a way to uh, turn a person into a thing. Um, Boy, if you Google She Wants It, which of course I've been doing, it's that. It's a little bit of my book, but it's mostly, you know, uh, pictures that men have put up to show other men, like, yeah, right, she wants it. We're looking at her together. She wants it. He, a man talking to another man about. And I think one of the things I realized, and this happened on another conversation, is that when I moved, when I went into puberty and became like this very visible, you know, had like huge. There's some people here who remember my huge breasts from before, right? <laughs> yes. They were gigantic. Cat calling her, her breasts? Remember? They're cat calling your past breasts? <laughs> <laughs> they were so big. And I got them like in high school at the age of 17. And I turned into something that kind of belonged to men. I think that's sort of like a lot of my trauma is that like something happened where suddenly I was that person. 
that was being looked at and my body, I think, was making men think something of me, which was this, the she wants it thing. And then really reclaiming and saying, no, she wants it the way a woman would say it about an, a woman who they respect. A director, you know, to want things as an artist, you have to want to see something. You have to want to cast that actor. You have to want that backdrop. You have to want a lens. If you're becoming a director, you have to be, you know, like, ramping into your desire over and over and over again, all day long, going, I want, I want, I want. And people say, why are there so few female directors? It's like, because women are shamed for desire yeah. in our society from the moment they are girls. Yeah. And they're systemically excluded. S yes, and yeah. they're systemically <laughs> yeah. excluded, both. Yeah. Men are, men are opportunity hoarding, yep. but for there us even to have the opportunity to fight and to say, I have the right to see we would have to have been able to say, I want, I want, I want, I want, all day throughout our entire lives mm -hmm. to be able to say, I want a $100 million budget to make this movie. I want, you know, it's, it's really fucking crazy yeah. when you think about it, that anybody does actually pull themselves out of this suggestion that they should only want to be wanted and that they should be careful not to be wanted too much. This fucking tightrope yeah. that we're on our whole damn lives. Yeah. And so the book is kind of about getting off the tightrope and starting to make things. And you know, with the, the, the story actually where you talk about uh, the breast being liberated into a, a, a you know, that, that story is so powerful in the book and, and, and how you made the decision and just yes. went through it. I, I was so moved by it. And actually, you know, just the power of storytelling because as an artist that now collaborates with you to yeah. hear your story. When we think about the importance of story, especially now, and not just in naming, but in also um, sharing uh, all of uh, your journeys, both in your professional life, in your love life, and in your desire to really go after the way you want to be loved. And similar to how, you know, there was, sometimes it just takes one story, whether it was the story of Trayvon Martin's mom who mm -hmm. spoke out, or whether it was Rachel DeHollander who first spoke out of, around Larry Nasser, mm -hmm. um, to tell a story is, is so powerful. And one of the things that you are now mm -hmm. doing, which I, I love how the book in, in the end really talks about this, is you talk about whose story's not at the table, mm -hmm. right? We're not hearing from people with disabilities, you know, and, and even in the way that you story, that you told stories, and we're gonna get into this, um, you actually had entire new ways of imagining your, your workplace. You had yeah. new, new definitions. And so just talk about that a, a little bit about the work you're doing now to really get more stories and, and through you know, your, the, the publishing stuff that you're doing and, and through some of your projects. Yeah, well, I, it seems like a very simple thing. And I think I used to just say, like, the more women who tell stories, the better, because it just moves that gaze over to the female, over to the feminine. Fe feminine. Um, but of course, you know, as we're all recognizing that feminism that isn't intersectional is really not, is, is not going to work, um, I just now say whenever, I never just say women, you know, I say women, people of color, queer people, uh, non-binary people, people with disabilities. I always try to say all the things together because there's the thing that you can't say, which is not white straight men. You can't say that because right. it's too troubling and it hurts the feelings of straight white men because they go, haven't we do been doing a lot of great stuff? Why, why is everybody so mad at us? Um, and so, you, so we have to be careful not to say it. It's like in our home, it, you know, we don't want to say anything to upset dad because of the way that you know, the masculinity in the home is centered. And, you know, and I think a lot of people of, of, of different generations were, were careful not to set their parents off into fights. But I think a lot of people felt that, uh, that, that the idea of like, you know, believing that dad is okay and that we're safe is this thing we kind of invest in. And so we're, we've been perpetuating this as well. And one at a time, one story at a time, one book at a time, one Twitter feed at a time, replacing those I ams with people of color, women of color, queer people, non-binary people, people who have felt otherized, just beginning to stack up those, those me's, you know, in our lives, however that is, is a way to sort of begin a quiet revolution one, one at a time. So that's what we're doing. We have like an imprint at Topple and we just make sure that every project, you know, we do is from 
a woman of color or a queer person, or it has to be something that's never been done before, and it has to be something that's gonna change the world. So that's what we're up to. Yes. So now let's talk about transparent. Yeah, so before we talk about transparent, we're gonna bring out a chair. Let's bring out a chair. <laughs> Let's bring out a chair. Need a chair. Let's bring out a chair. Let's bring out a chair. There's the chair. The chair is there. <laughs> this is why it's so great to have Faith on stage. I don't know about that one. That wasn't that great. We don't have to release that. Let's song. bring out another chair. Let us bring another chair. That's a little better. So we got, the, we got the, the delicious juice you guys have all been waiting for. I think you all want a real live Pfefferman in your midst. So we got none other than Sarah Pfefferman. Let's welcome Amy Landegger. talk a little bit about transparent and then we're going to let you guys ask some questions because I think that's the thing. But yeah, you go talk about the damn show. Um, Sarah Pfefferman, what's it like to be a Pfefferman? It's the best. <laughs> People come up to you on the street and they think you're... Yeah, I, I usually get like a, a love-hate reaction. There's mm. a lot of like, you're crazy. <laughs> or like, oh my God, I love Sarah so much. I can't. I get, so I get, I get, yeah. I, people think I'm a lot more sexually progressive than I really am. I, I swear, especially when they're drunk. Um, I was at a concert. I haven't really, I don't know if I've told you this. Tell story. it. I went to like old Cella, you know, and it was like the stones oh, just for the old people. <laughs> and um, I was with my fiance, Mr. Bradley Whitford. Thank Ooh. you, Jill Soloway. He was on um, season one of Transparent. And, he, he, and he, season two. He played Marcy at the cross-dressing camp, and then he played none other than Magnus Hirschfeld. Yeah. So Jill gave me the best job I'll ever have and the best man I'll ever have. So thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so we got, so because some guy recognized Bradley from the West Wing, they put us in a VIP like booth with like bottle service and really expensive food. And we were like, oh, this will be nice. This is going to be great. And there's this couple and this woman, she's kind of checking, like looking at us, but not really talking and just kind of drinking and drinking. And as the music goes, and then at some point she's like, she walks over and she whispers in my ear, you make me think about pussy. <laughs> And she just like got drunker and drunker. I was like, I love you on that show and you make me want pussy. <laughs> In front of her husband. Oh my God. So we go back, there's two nights. We go over the second night. And of I'm course like, you're gonna go back the second night. Well, I think, she's, I think she's not, she can't possibly be there or that drunk again, right? Okay. Second night, she's like, Ugh. just literally the second night vomits. In the, anyway, so that's, that's what, I, that's what that's Sarah gross. gets. That's gross. Um, I was at like a rock concert and this couple's like, we're into BDSM too. And I'm like, <laughs> so Bradley and I always joke, like everyone thinks Bradley should be president and I'm like the BDSM queen. So yeah. that's, that's what you, yeah. you get. But no, it's a true story. Like I never used a dildo until uh, we got to set. Didn't, didn't oh. have one. I know, how pathetic. And they're like, what kind of dildo do you want in this scene? And I'm like, I don't know, what are my options? <laughs> And of course, I picked the one that Gabby wanted for her scene, so I couldn't use that, so I got some purple one. But I, 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 this was all new to me, is the point. This was all new to me. Um, it was amazing. It still makes me get, I always cry. I always cry, because it was, so, it, as good as it was to watch, it was, it's been that good to do. And um, it's just the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean. You'll see what I'm going to do later. This, one, this person here put a spell on me <laughs> four years ago. I actually turned down the audition for Transparent because I had been on a show um, that was where I did my first sex scene. 
And it was so bad that after the first take, I burst into tears. Mm. And they put a beta blocker in my mouth. Didn't even tell me. This makeup person just came up and put something in my mouth and said, you're going to be fine. Um, wow. We finished the scene. I went home and I called my manager and I said, I'm never doing that again. And then, we found, then they said, oh, we didn't do enough coverage on the guy because you were, were upset. So you have to come back and do it again. So we did it again. Then they fired the director and said, okay, it was the director's fault. Now we're going to do it a third time. Um, and wow. so I got this, this thing from my, now no one knew who Amy, who I was, Amy Landecker. I never speak of myself in third person. I just did it. <laughs> no one knew who Amy Landecker was, but like, I wasn't a namey person at all. And this thing came out and it said, you know, on camera, sexual nudity required, which is one of those things that they tell you in a breakdown so that you know the content of the show and what's going to be required and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, no, thank you. And then I got this call. Jill Soloway wants to know why you don't want to be in their show. And I was like, how the fuck does Jill Soloway know who I am? So we had lunch in Silver Lake. We sure did. And I watched this movie, Afternoon Delight, which I have to say, if you have not seen it, was like the first time I saw myself in a movie. <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. And I was weeping because there was this complex character who expressed everything I felt. And it was scary. You know, like I knew if I worked with Jill, I would be pushed because you go to places that we don't normally go, but it was also so fully realized. And it was Catherine Hahn, who is probably one of the best actresses that we have. Rabbi Raquel. Yeah, Rabbi, Rabbi Raquel, Raquel. Um, <laughs> who thank God was not available to play Sarah, because otherwise I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> she was on another show. Um, so, but it, 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 after that I was like, oh my God, please, please, please let me be in your show. And, um, that's, and that's how, I got, and Jill said to me, I think you might have a different experience when yeah. I'm directing this. Yeah. And trust, will you trust me? And then I was tied to a tree and whipped. <laughs> yeah. And she got naked for them. <laughs> and then I got a lot of, you're so courageous, which is code yeah. for you look like a real human being and we're not used yeah. to that. How, how amazing that you're willing to show yourself. <laughs> well, I actually felt that that was one of the, my big takeaways is that like, wow, this is like not just beyond vanilla sex, but there's actually consent, there's conversations around polyamory, there's curiosity. Um, and I thought that that was such a powerful way because you, you, know, you say that even for you to be transformed in the process, I mean, imagine some of the viewers. And so can you talk a little bit about that, Jill, is around just even your, the way that you made decisions, the way you helped make people safe, and also were so about showing the complexity, not just like, oh, you know, two people lock eyes, and then they make sounds and the lights are off. Yeah. And so talk a little bit about like consent and how you really yeah. weave that into some of the... Well, I talk a lot in the book about my process, which involves naming action, beats, beat changes, and blocking. We have like a very specific process that we use that's kind of old school Stanislavski actioning, which a lot of people who know theater know. It's a verb that you can feel. And a beat is a unit of measurement of that verb. And then a beat change is when it changes. And um, we really like go through every scene, at least a long scene, and we just figure out where the beat changes are. We'll mess around with the script a little bit, but a lot of you know, shows will prepare for a scene by having these kinds of like endless meetings. And our meetings are actually only figuring out where the beat changes are. And there's a scene with you and Len and Lila in season four. We get high. Miss Lila, the JCC teacher. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and they go from you know, talking to smoking pot to, to having like, another conversation. They move through multiple gauntlets and they ultimately do decide to have a three-way and there's there are many many times where we kind of watch the energy in the room change and those are beat changes and those are somebody who read my book an early draft of my book was like you know Jill your obsession with beat changes <laughs> consent happens in the beat change mm -hmm. and one of the things that Joan Shekel who's one of my gurus taught me is that the beat change happens for everybody in the room at the same time. Mm -hmm. This was a huge piece of my craft because I didn't know how to direct. I knew how to make things one way or another, better or worse, but the idea that beat changes happen for everybody in the room at the same time 
means that there's a consensus and there's a continued consensus that we, that we stay in together. And in those beat changes are when we consent. And I realized, you know, I say in the book, like, wow, you look back at movies and TV shows besides the effing boob shot at the beginning of Love Boat, we also watched all kinds of portrayals besides like all the awful portrayals of stuff like Animal House and, you know, Porkies and all of these things that were just woman hating and girl shaming. We also saw sex presented where our consent was almost always, women's consent was almost always edited out. So two people would see each other, they would lock eyes, maybe they would start kissing, um, and then, you know, you cut to them in bed. You know, they just like that fa the fast moving kind of, now they're doing it, and then it's like it's over and the sheets are above there and they're smoking. And um, you, every, all the moments where people would have made the decisions to do things, and again, it doesn't have to be that sort of classic college thing of like, do I have consent to touch your breast now, your right breast? And what about your left breast? <laughs> you know, it's, that joke is, is unnecessary when people really know that real consent doesn't happen in a snapshot, but it's, a, it's really a spiritual, human, ethical agreement that the person that you're with, no matter their gender, both people are gonna be thinking the whole time, I hope this other person is enjoying themselves, and I'm gonna be checking in the whole time to make sure they're enjoying themselves. And that's something that can be done with or without words. And it can be done um, in, it, I think it happens like in these beat changes. So yeah, I think that's what we do on the set is we know when and where things are gonna happen. And Jill also has been working with this guy, Jim Frona, who's her, their DP on most of, yeah. a lot of your projects. And, they, and he takes Shekel's workshop mm -hmm. and is a very much, I would say your spirit animal. <laughs> like they're very connected and he shoots that scene particularly, I just, when I saw it, yeah. he, we were, you know, we improv a little bit. The writers are very generous. They're all brilliant, but they're also like, hey, go where you need to go. And it was a really complicated scene because we went to like coming over to like ending up in bed and it was kind of the first time the three of us met. So you had to find this way to each other, you yeah. know? And, and it was like, he, you look at the edit and there's this one shot where I'm looking over to, Rob, who plays my husband, and we are asking each other, do you want to do this? Yeah. And Jimmy, you know, so I'm on the couch, Rob's over there on the floor, and none of it's planned, and Jimmy knows just from what's happening, because he stays with us, he doesn't like shoot, like these, you know, the, you also go on, and you were talking about the director who's like standing at the monitor, there's also like the DP who's just obsessed with light and tech and doesn't, isn't, actually with you at all yeah. at all and jimmy could give a fuck which is why sometimes i you know i look like i'm 80 years old but <laughs> which is fine it's <laughs> totally fine um but because what you feel is what he's shooting is what i'm feeling not how i look and mm. so he sees this thing and he catches it and he goes pans to rob and pans back to me and none of that's on a shot list because right. we didn't know when that consent was gonna happen. And he caught it. And it's so fucking and, cool yeah, when you caught see it. Because like we're all, what we're documenting, it almost is like street theater, yeah. you know, or a documentary where everybody's channeling their characters. We have the script that lets us know where we show up and where to park the trucks. But then when we get on the set and we say, here we go, we're actually in this other thing that is really just simple, feminist, Judy Chicago, circle-based pedagogy. Yeah. Hells yeah. It is, it's just like, yeah. we're all here, you know, we're circling up, except yeah. for we're acting. We're gonna feel each other's energy, and we're gonna, and you know what, we're gonna know. There's gonna be a way that we're gonna know, and then we're gonna film And when it. we wouldn't know, we knew something was wrong, and it had yeah. to be fixed. Like, something in the story, something in the writing. If we were stuck, because we were so connected to each other, we were like, uh-oh. Yeah. So we would just all group up and fix it. And it, has that, it had that feeling when we were working of childhood play, you know, where you're just playing. And there wasn't like male ego or there wasn't, yeah. it was, you know, we used to say feminine energy is collaborative, right? Like, it's like, there's this yes. certain sense of like, we're all involved, yes. we're all included. And so I cannot tell you how much the men enjoyed that, yeah. <laughs> who were not the teamsters. You know, because it's anti-patriarchal energy. They because, want it too. Yeah, well, most people actually on most sets yes. and at most jobs are walking around 
worried that they're gonna get in trouble. Right. Yep. And usually there's something yeah. happening that involves a number. So people are either tapping their you know, watches, do it faster or else. Um, it's either like a watch or it's a budget. People are usually talking about time or money and everybody's afraid they're gonna be in trouble if they don't do it quickly enough or cheap enough. And that ethos is really true on TV and movie shows as well. And besides the fact that they're trying to do it for less money in less time, there's also this auteur mentality of the guy who wrote it and the guy who directed making sure it's right. So everybody's just kind of scared the whole time until big name person says like, okay, fine, we got it. And so everybody's yeah. like in this really tense mood all day because they want to make sure dad's happy wow. again. We're just back to this yeah. thing, you know, of like yeah. de- of, of happy father. And yeah. li- it literally feels so easy to me to go to work because it's about undoing, undoing, yeah. undoing all the things and letting go and saying, no, none of the rules apply here. We're here to have fun. We're right. here to take risks. And guess yeah. what? We get to film it. Yeah. And what I mean, what Amy just said, you said this is what women's leadership or basically uh, non-male leadership looks like. That's exactly why we need women and non-binary people in politics in the White House, because it actually will completely transform our societies. And I love that it's not just at the artistic level, it's literally, it's at the the global level. Vote, people, votes. Maybe we should grab some questions. Yes, yes, let's take some audience questions. Time for questions if you got them. Someone's got a mic, I think. It would be really embarrassing if nobody had one. Raise your hand. All right, we got a first question. Okay, we have someone right here, second row. Hi, um, this is a question for Jill. I'm also a mom of, of boys, as you are, and I'm trying to raise feminist sons. I uh, had a discussion with my 16-year-old who said, Mom, I agree with 95% of what you say, but the way you say it is threatening to me. I saw a sign from one of my classmates that says the future is female. How do I fit in? Mm. And I didn't have a good answer for him. So any advice you have about raising boys would be helpful. That's such a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think about that too, you know, what, what, how does the, fu- the future is female um, t-shirt make my son feel and, and how do they fit in? But I, you know, I, I do have some answers for men and I think if you can extrapolate it down to boys, it's helpful. So, you know, what I think this movement offers men are two great things. One is they can stop working as hard. Like put down the shopping bags, take a, take a break. And that means, again, that they're in their job with the other people. They think they have to define everything for everybody all the time. They think they have to summarize and name, and they actually get to just be vulnerable, lead with their vulnerability, and allow the other people in their office or in their workplace, just men get the chance to notice how much space they're taking up. And actually, it's a pleasurable thing because they can just let go a little bit And the same thing with consent. My son actually told me this. He's like, somebody needs to get the message out to men that this is good news. This is good news for men, that they're not gonna have to carry both their consent and the woman's consent. Because men have been doing this thing where they decide if the woman wants it or doesn't want it. Mm, And they're trying to guess the whole time. And so now it's like men are afraid they're gonna be in trouble. No, men have the great opportunity where they get to be sure that the person they're with is actually having fun and happy, this is good news. So I think you can say the future is female means that you're not gonna get shoved walking down the hallway by another boy just because you're a boy. You know, that happens to my nine-year-old because he's a boy. And this is what boys do when they walk down the hallway. They hurt each other because that's what boys do. They tease people, you, know, you get teased if, you're, if you have a fucking purple water bottle. You know, you, you, the, the binary is yeah. so harsh in yeah. school that you can say to your sons, it doesn't mean that you won't, uh, you know, be admired and honored. It means that, you know, you don't have to fit into this idea of what, like, a real man is. And, you know, for me, I just keep reminding people, like, we're not just talking about masculinity, we're talking about war. Mm, yeah. And we're talking about what it means to have a colonialist, dominant, culture where you're trying to you know, yeah. win and succeed at all costs. So you, the good news about the future is female is that that means the end of war. 
That means the end of violence. That means the end of domination. Like your son can imagine a beautiful world where he's not afraid that somebody's going to attack him violently because a a, a female or feminine future is one that holds space for tolerance and love and peace. I mean, obviously it's a huge dream, but if Trump could dream about being in the White House, why can't we dream about this? Exactly. Are there any Let's other, see, is, folks, is there any other, other questions? questions? Up there, helping the entire right global patriarchy. We got one right more. up here in the front. Oh, oh there's oh, one up there's there There's one up there with a mic. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Well, first is just for anyone on the panel, not just you, Jill. Um, so you talked about intersectionality, and how do you go about intersectionality now? Like, as a queer Jew, or for you, Fabiana, as a woman of color, how do you, like, in today's landscape, climate, that's the word, where everything can seem so, like, toxic, how do you go about that? Mm. Yeah, do you want to yeah. answer? Yeah, so um, to me what intersectionality means is that our fights are all connected. You know, so for example, as an environmentalist, I feel that the way that we extract from the earth, the way that we treat Mother Earth is the same way we treat women and poor workers and animals, we extract, extract, extract. And so intersectionality also means that in the same way that a black person can feel threatened to their life when they get pulled over the police, well, that's also connected to how some, when sometimes walking down the street as a female presenting person, that you are living in constant fear. So intersectionality means that our, our struggles and our challenges are all connected and that we actually have to look at who has the most power because it's the same people who are taking our right to reproductive, the the same people who are taking our rights, um, our reproductive rights away are the same people who are denying climate, are the same people who are breaking up families at the border, and are the same people profiting off mass incarceration and the sale of guns. And so we have to understand that if we can all fight together, if we can find um, unity um, in our collective future and be able to define our future, not just fight together, but also define our future, that that's where the real power is because As oppressed people, we've been disempowered for so long and that sometimes we fight each other um, and we forget to really see. You know, there's a lot of profiteering off of um, what's happening to us uh, and the environment. So that's that's what I would say intersectionality is. (laughs) We got a next question up on the left. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm always interested in how the Pfeffermans and how the story both brings t- brings some stories that a lot of people don't see, like um, being trans at an airport or different things like that. But also the Pfeffermans are cringeworthy sometimes and um, like very selfish or different things. And sometimes um, the Pfeffermans have, have interactions with people of color that are pretty quind- cringeworthy as white people. And I'm just interested in why you make the choices you make around the ways that you, you lift up, like experiences of otherness, but then also have the Pfeffermans doing things that make people just make me sometimes as like a white queer Jew want to hide. So different, I'm interested in, mm-hmm. in your process yeah. and your choices. Yeah, um, I, I love that phrase cringeworthy. It's a new one. You used to say fun, comfortable. Fun, comfortable. <laughs> Fun. Yeah, fun, comfortable. Yeah, I like it. And Faith and I have been talking about cringeometers our whole lives. Yeah, we say cringe. What's awkward is my therapist has a big problem with the Pfeffermans. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite not. She thinks they're to, awful people. They're awful. It's hard for her to watch it. Like, okay, it's not me. I mean, we we were. We were at a Q&A early on. Do you remember when Gabby just went off? On, no offense, but on that question, yeah. was like. On television, you've been watching male characters who are the most evil fucks in the world, like Mad Men and Breaking Bad, and no one says anything, but because we have vaginas, that was like her big speech. We were like, okay, Gabby, 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 Gabby. Um, The other thing I thought, though, is it's such a tradition, and maybe I'm being, I'm only Jewish, so I'm not allowed to say it, but isn't it like such a Jewish comedic tradition that we, that we make you cringe? I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a show. I mean, isn't that it's, part it's, of it's what a, the fun the, is? The show is also like, it's a, it's a lot about depression and anxiety and shame. 
Yeah. The show is about shame, you know. That's one of the big, big feelings in there is like a bunch of people who haven't really been able to connect because they were brought up in a house with this big, huge secret. So they're kind of like reaching around in the dark for just how to be. And uh, the villain is, for, for them, I think, is just life. They want to love, they want to connect, and they can't figure out how to get to that feeling. You know, I think they all have some kind of, um, I guess, like attachment <coughs> wounds, you know? So you're watching Broken People, which I think is what's beautiful about the show. But, you know, when people like think of it as a referendum on Jews, um, you know, they happen to be Jewish and they happen to be broken. Um, and, you know, I guess Larry David's like cringeworthy, right? That's the same thing, you know? <laughs> I think that's just kind of, yeah, that's, I guess that's our brand, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Should we do one more question and then we'll move into the We've got final two more group? questions. The first one's going to be on your yeah. right. There's one up there and then you had one down here, too. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Jill and Faith, hi, my name's Laura. Hi. And I met you guys like 25 years ago when Tom Hanks came to the real live Brady Bunch and Rita Wilson got on stage and did the cheer, remember? Yeah. And, um, and I have to drive my girlfriend and I'm back to uh, Carmel. And um, so I can't stay for the signing, so I wanted to say that in front of everyone. That night. Oh, do you want to just bring your book up right now? <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that do night, it. I just want to say that that night, um, uh, uh, Susan Messing, Tom Booker, all those people, right? Oh. And, and they were all gathered around Tom Hanks, and both of you sat near me on a lounge chair. We were just watching the excitement. And you both went, so who are you? What are you about? Yeah. And it was like, I really felt like you gave a shit, you know, like you really wanted to know who I was and what I was about. And I never forgot that. It was like you were both these creative, interesting, this duo that was like, who am I? I don't know. I'm just sitting here watching Tom Hanks. But you were both so open and interesting. And it was a cool time in Chicago. And I really, I, I cherish that memory. Jill, I've seen you say in a speech, um, I can't remember which one it was, because um, I've watched a few. I love them. I always feel nourished after I listen to you talk. I do. I just feel... Oh, yeah. Why didn't I think of that? Um, but you said um, according, about Trump, in reference to Trump, you said, I hope, something along the lines of, I hope that his demise is as dramatic as his rise, <laughs> something like that. And I've used those words to comfort myself. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so do you still feel hopeful about that or still think about that? I do. I, I think about like his his personal bombast in believing that he can do what he's doing. And, you know, we, we were in the White House... Uh, the transparent was was brought to the White House a few years ago, and we all went there and we walked around that place thinking that, wow, when Hillary's here, this is going to be our White House. And then I think it was unthinkable what happened, and it still is unthinkable. And I have like a fantasy that I really keep in mind, and I'll share it with you. Um, it's like you know, I don't know, maybe two years from now, maybe six years from now. But it's a queer White House. It's a big queer White House. And you know how like when, um, you know, like when Barack was president, there would be these like amazing parties and you'd see like everybody African-American on their Instagram, like having these great parties. And I'm like, can just imagine, you know, these big queer trans parties at the White House. Yes. And that like every, we're dancing there, and we have like amazing queer president, like Kamala's president, or maybe Kamala's vice president. And we have like this real party going on there. And then in part of the fantasy, the prison where they're all kept is downstairs from the White House. <laughs> and I go down there during the party to check on them. <laughs> Trump and Kavanaugh, they're all down there. I'm like, hang on a second, guys, keep partying. I'm going to go make sure they have their dinner. And I go down there, and they're all in their prison cells, like literally in their prison cells. And instead of like kicking their food to them, I like hand it to them kindly, and I say, are you okay? Do you need like a warm jacket? Like I'm, mer- I'm merciful, merciful to them <laughs> during the queer party. Yes, That's my... <laughs> Where's Pence, I want to know? He's down there in the prison, too. They're all in the underground. <laughs> yeah, it's like bunkers. It's adjacent. He We're partying. In solitary confinement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just think we have to think those, you know, th- those kinds of visions. Oh we have God, to dream yeah, those funny. big dreams. <laughs> those, <laughs> yeah. It's hysterical. Dream the same kinds of dreams that Bannon was dreaming and Scaramucci was dreaming. Oh, like, all these gosh. fucking people who don't deserve this power were the, dreaming the, of this the power. The only thing that Bannon has said that's actually true is that he said... 
hey, y'all, look out for this Me Too movement because it's going to undo thousands of years of patriarchy. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, that's exactly We're right. clapping for Steve Bannon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope he's right. All right, we so, have time for one last question. Great. I just wanted to remind you all that Jill will be signing books after the program if yeah. you hadn't had a chance to get your question answered. Oh, yeah, that's true. So one more? Yes. Um, it's Danielle. Oh, Danielle. Hi. 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 I really was thinking about what you said about not wanting to imitate the patriarchy with your man spreading. And yeah. I really, I found myself man spreading in unexpected places and didn't feel good about it. I was like, why am I doing this? This isn't necessarily like authentic to my being and this isn't yeah. how I want to be sitting right now. Um, but something in me was doing it. And so I guess my question is, how do you recommend um, being authentic to yourself when you need to compensate for something? So like you, you feel like you're not being seen and you yeah. don't want to overcompensate, but at the same time, you do need to compensate in order to be seen as a full on person. Yeah, it's hard. It's like, I think, I think the issue that a lot of people who are otherized are feeling is that, you know, we have felt so you know, vulnerable that the second we start to imitate the patriarchy, which is a thought exercise that I do, that's like what I've been doing the past few years is trying to, you know, s stick my tummy out like a really powerful guy. It's like enter a room, tummy first, and just be like, you know, you can't do that unless you're pregnant as a woman. But like guys who just like really like proud can like enter a room like belly out. You know, so I try to just do that to remind myself what it feels like to have privilege, to just do a bodily exercise of like, I don't have to shrink myself, I can take up space. And then the second I do that for too long, you realize that's like an offensive way to enter a room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yet, yeah, so it's like we, we never get the opportunity to really, you know, take on privilege because as liberal people, we're so aware of how other people see us. So I think it's, it's important to kind of just, you can do these experience, you know, for me it's about finding a middle place where you're not imitating masculinity, you're not shrinking into some sort of perfect femininity, but it does feel like a kind of um, neutral, balanced, neither, either, both, and, where you're, you know, making room for what's around you and um, centering, you know, if you're in a room full of men, then I think centering yourself is great. But if you're in a room full of people of color, then, you know, maybe not centering yourself. So it's, it's the same thing as like the one-on-one -on -one consent conversation, you know, that, that you would want to be aware when you're having sex that the other person is also having a good time and that everybody feels good the whole time. And it's the same thing in a group sit setting is feeling of the kind of energy of the room you're in and doing your best to be part of it instead of to dominate it. I guess. All right. Thank you. Guys. Lots of like one person up front. Do we have time? Oh yeah. So there's one more we question up front. One yes, more. Because yes, she had her hand up the whole time. Yes. Just shout it out. Shout, shout it out. Shout it out. Oh, there it is. There's the mic. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's see. I think when I'm, my question is about um, females controlling our story about our own sexuality. And in the context, I'm a female, I'm a comedian, and I do a lot of mics where I'm the only female um, in the room. And I'm comfortable with that because I know I have like an army of people like you who, who validate what I'm saying and I'm not crazy. And my challenge actually comes in when there's, this is really hard to say in a way that sounds like how I'm gonna want it to say, but women who maybe are thriving and feel their power in catering to the male gaze or um, maybe have, have just like walked a different lifestyle and like, you know, I call them in my head like names that I'm like, like blowjob comedians. They're just talking about blowjobs the whole time. And yeah. like, how do I, how do we work together as women um, when I feel like um, they haven't read the same books I have or like yeah. they're keeping the this patriarchy, is, yeah, you know, this, as you said. I think yeah. this is probably like one of the most important questions that we're facing right now as women and as feminists is this question of um, whether or not we're all in one big tent and whether we have to be in one big tent. And I think it does come down to this, this question, which is kind of, you know, a simple way of putting it would be, you know, 
um, without being, you know, th that um, there are women who are specifically catering to men and to patriarchy for their power. You know, so I am crazy about the Kardashians. I'm obsessed with them. I, I love them and I love watching them because I'm looking at the way that they're doing things that feel really good to them, which are engaging in deep femininity, you know, three hours of hair and makeup with their sisters, you know, just deeply into the kind of aesthetic. And I don't really see them as, um, I mean, I, th I think that when we live in patriarchy, people are going to be doing things to get the attention of men. That's not the fault of women, that's the fault of patriarchy. We live in a world where the more attention you get from men, the more money you have and the more power you have. So to ask women not to do it when it's one of the fastest ways to power doesn't really work. You're lucky that you have a way to feel powerful without needing to do things that feel uncomfortable. But I think when I see you know, that situation, I think you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, I would have looked at women like that and said like, oh, poor thing, she needs to like, I need to help her you know, not be so obsessed with men, but I'm actually really, really interested in the most sex positive femme presenting women as the most feminist people, because I think like a really like super femme presenting woman who's very openly <coughs> comfortable with sex um, or even a sex worker, you know, still has the right to say no, still has the right to say I'm not consenting, still has the right to boundaries. Um, nothing that anybody does, including being like, highly sexual and super obsessed with men um, means that they're giving up their power. They still have their power. So that's what I try to do. Yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. But anyway, that's a great question. And that, to me, that question is the question that we're taking into these sort of debate forums at every stop. It's this question of like, how big can, does the tent need to be? Can it just be feminism? Does it also need to be trans libera liberation? Does it also, does it need to be more? But like, the bigger the tent, the more we say, well, we don't all agree. And so th there's this question of building a movement out of lots of, you know. And I'm like literally thinking, I, my lips are really dry and I need more of my red lips. Do it. While we're having this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being, yeah. There's what about that fanny pack? Th this is supposedly represents a baboon's ass, by the way, according to a biology professor that I had in college, because our sexual organs are on the inside, so. <laughs> and that's a nice fanny pack. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's cute. All right, well, we're going to move into our last part of the evening here. So um, a lot of people know that we were um, oh, struck by our own Me Too moment on the show, and we um, went through a lot as a family. Oy vey. Oy vey. Yeah, we did a lot of... Um, we had, we had trauma and we had healing and we're still healing. Um, and Jeffrey's not coming back, uh, but, we, but we are coming back. Transparent is coming back. <laughs> we're wrapping it up with something special and instead of telling you what it's gonna be, we're gonna show you a quick little, you guys are the first people to see this trailer. Little trailer, little trailer. Cue the trailer. 